I believe that a significant portion of the way we use, we collectively use our intelligence is to rationalize whatever we wanted to do in the first place. And so Michel Foucault, in many ways, was simply arguing in favor of his fetish. Hi, Joyful Warriors. Tiffany Justice here. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we have Derek Jensen with us. Derek is a writer uh, and a teacher. And I came across Derek uh, in a video on Twitter. He was at a library and he was answering some questions from people about different uh, subjects. And queer theory uh, was kind of the subject of what he was talking about. Queer theory and this um, part of queer theory where you kind of intersect with pedophilia. And um, for those of you that are listening, you know that um, we're learning a lot about queer theory entering our schools. Um, this idea of the LGBTQ um, umbrella rainbow flag stuff that we have happening. Um, we have gay members at Moms for Liberty. We have members who have gay kids. But this Q part, this queer theory part, um, continues to be troubling. And so I know a lot of you have questions about it. I have questions about it. I personally don't know a lot. And I thought I'd invite Derek on to tell us a little bit about why uh, they tried to cancel him at a, a library talk that he gave. I know a lot of you, uh, that'll sound familiar. We've had a few uh, libraries try to cancel on us. And so Derek, welcome to the, Joy the Moms for Liberty Joyful Warrior podcast. Um, tell us about your library talk that kind of made you an internet sensation. Well, first, thanks for having me. And yes. um, yeah, that talk was really sort of a, or the video that came out of that was sort of a, a cell phone by the, by the people who tried to cancel me. Because my original, the thing that was supposed to happen is the main things I write about are environmentalism and domestic violence. And, um, and also like, why do people do bad things? That's, that's sort of been my wheelhouse. And I was supposed to do an environmental talk. This, this small group of attorneys uh, called me up and said, will you come do a talk in Eugene? And I said, sure. And it was just a private talk for their organization, maybe 35 lawyers, informal over dinner or something. And um, then it became public news that this is going to happen. And the, uh, the trans activists and the queer theorists could not allow this to happen. So I got a call from that attorney group saying, um, sorry, but we have to cancel you because they have said that they will destroy our organization if, you, if we let you speak. And I said, so first, I just want to be clear that you're in a group of attorneys and you're a group of public interest attorneys and you are giving in to a mob. I just want to be clear that this is what's happening. He said, oh, I'm fully aware of the irony of that. And I said, second, you're also, as environmentalists, you're used to going up against big corporations. And so you recognize you're giving in to this fairly small mob and you expect to take on Weyerhaeuser and you expect to take on these transnational corporations and, and somehow win if you give in to this level of pressure. And he said, I am fully aware of the, it was a very pleasant conversation. I'm fully aware of the irony. I just don't want my group destroyed. Yeah. I said, okay, great understood and you know we part of the makeably but i don't give in to bullies and so i was not going to let that stand so i set up a talk uh at the local library where as you know libraries are required by law to by the constitution it's been at the supreme court multiple times to if they have a room that's open for one group they have to have it open for other groups they cannot uh keep you out because you happen to not believe that women should be forced to share their most intimate spaces with males. Um, so I was going to go to a talk and uh, the trans activists and the queer theorists found out about that, of course, because I publicized it and they uh, pitched a fit and they did things like set off stink bombs and they, you know, you, you we're not going to allow this to happen in our town. It's like, I'm sorry, it's your town? You actually control this town? It it's, doesn't belong to anybody else? There's no... Anyway, um, and what I wanted to talk about is environmental destruction. And then also I was talking about 
I was abused as a kid. And I was, I was talking about that too. I was writing, I was talking about those things. And I knew that they were going to do things like set off stink bombs, have radios in their, in their backpacks, um, screaming, chanting, yelling, I'm a Nazi. Evidently, again, believing that men, sh men shouldn't be in women's prison makes you a Nazi and believing that men shouldn't be in women's sports makes you a Nazi. Um, anyway, so had they not pitched a fit, there probably would have been about 50 people in the audience and would have been live streamed to another 500. But the night before I had this idea, which is if they really make me mad, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. And the something that I came up with that night was queer theory jeopardy and queer theory jeopardy queer i'm sorry queer theory pedophilia jeopardy and queer theory pedophilia jeopardy is just okay you know you give the answer and one of them for a hundred is godfather of queer theory um also uh advocated for the elimination of age of consent laws as in down to infants and i didn't add this because i didn't know it at the time but also raped young boys in tunisia um, that's the answer. The question is, who is Michel Foucault, godfather of queer theory? Um, and then 200 was, uh, what percent, I believe 50% is the answer. And the question is, um, what percent of the founding document of queer theory by Gail Rubin is promoting pedophilia? And it's 50%. It's, it's, it's mainly, um, an apologia for, for, for pedophilia. Um, she, uh, yeah, she compares various fetishes like, and, and including pedophilia to a taste for spicy food. Um, and anyway, so I, I went through all that and, you know, like I said, if they wouldn't have done all this, there would have been maybe 500 people total to see the talk, but that video has gone viral several times and has been seen by millions of people now who have been introduced to queer theory who would not have been introduced otherwise. Oh, and, and one other part I want to want to say about this is the police were useless. Um, the police showed up and because they were, you know, creating terrible circumstances. Oh, and I had to have security with me. Um, and uh, anyway, the police showed up and the police, uh, at one point threatened to clear the room and they, they pulled me out of the room and they said, look, the library will give you your, your, the, the money you put down for the room. They'll give you that money back. That's just, we're ending the talk. And I said, no, you're not. Um, you can arrest me. You can do whatever you want, but I came here to give a talk and I'm giving a talk. And if I have to give it in the parking lot, I'll give it in the parking lot. It doesn't matter. I am giving a talk. And so you can, you can do whatever you want, but I'm, I'm going back in and finishing my talk. And because again, I don't think it's helpful to give in to bullies. And the, the other part of that that was interesting is the police kept arguing, look, they have a free speech right to, to, to shout at you. And that actually is not understanding how free speech works. Thurgood Marshall, former Supreme Court Justice, um, pointed out that the right to speak, free speech, also includes the right to be heard. So they... What free speech means is they are allowed to rent the room and to give a talk in which they say, what a Nazi I am, because I believe that lesbians shouldn't be made to feel bad if they don't want to have sex with a man. And that's how free speech works, is not by allowing somebody to shout you down, but instead by allowing them to speak in turn. Anyway, so that was that was the introduction. That was how that queer theory pedophilia jeopardy video came to be, and it's really funny. You know, I've written twenty eight books or something like that, and um, that has been seen by far more people than all of my books together have been. You know, have read. So it's it's you know I'm I'm now known as the queer theory pedophilia jeopardy guy instead of the guy who wrote twenty eight books that took me. 30 years to do. Well, I, me up. I, I wish I could tell you, I, I'm sorry for you in, in, in that respect. However, I'm thankful for you because I think that 
that video resonates with a lot of people. I think that the approach that you took was so interesting because it engaged people into a dialogue with you um, where, you know, you had half of the room who was very aware and wanted to hear what you had to say. And then I guess, you know, half of the room that that wasn't so interested um, in, in having your voice heard and in you exposing um, what what you were saying and exposing queer theory and that connection. Um, I, I heard you uh, do a, a talk where you were uh, talking about the fact that there was someone in the audience that you were, were aware had had um, a relationship with an underage, with a minor child or with a child. And you had thought about calling that person out. And uh, so often I think that the, the, the issue when people want to silence you, it's because they very much know exactly what it is that they are doing and they do not want it exposed. And so when you were talking about that person and saying, you know, oh, are you still having a relationship with children? Um, you know, of course they want to silence you, right? They, 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 what, what possible, um, for the majority of Americans, what possible explanation can be had for adults having a sexual relationship with a child? And I remember in the video, you were talking about your, uh, rape culture. And um, you, you made the point that, you know, pedophilia is the ultimate rape, right? The, the child can't consent to a sexual relationship. So the, the adult being a predator in that way is so obvious. Um, but there were a lot of people in the room that, that did not agree with you. I mean, they were yelling at you. It's, it's it, very interesting. I'll play a, a bit of the interview for, for viewers when they're watching this. Um, I'll, I'll add that in here. There is a long correlation between anarchism and pedophilia and support for pedophilia. <laughs> the... oh. oh, wait, 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 wait. That's a beautiful line. Thank you so much for asking. How about something relevant? I've been talking about rape culture all day. And pedophilia and the support of pedophilia is not rape culture? Actually, actually, it seems you're acting like this is a spurious connection. So we're going to play Jeopardy. This is, we're going to play queer theory, we're going to play queer theory, pedophilia, Jeopardy. Okay, answer. Uh, commonly called the godfather of queer theory. Who is Foucault? Who is Foucault? I got it. Okay, 100 points. Um, Foucault, uh, another way to ask this is who argued, no, I guess the answer would be, argued for the eradication of age of consent laws as in down to infants? Mm -hmm. Who is Foucault? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, uh, the author of the, the, author of the uh, founding document of queer theory. Who is Gail Rubin? Um, what percentage? No, no, the answer is 50%. Question is? The amount in that article that was a defense of pedophilia, specifically, quote, boy lovers, so men who talk boys. Oh. And since you're not believing me, quote, quote, this is in the founding document of queer theory. Like communists and homosexuals in the 1950s, Boy lovers are so stigmatized that it is difficult to find defenders of their civil liberties, let alone for their erotic orientation. That's in the founding document of queer theory. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using facts. <laughs> a thousand, a thousand apologies. One must never let facts in the way. Um, but so you expected there to be a lot of pushback. Um, you knew there was going to be pushback going in. Um, why were the trans activists in Antifa so against you? Um, had they read any of the books that you had written? Do you think that they agree with any of the other positions that you hold? Well, that's one of the things that's kind of funny is probably they agree with, yeah, I don't know, 90% of what I've written or something. And um, I mean, I don't even agree with more than 90%. I don't agree with everything I've written. You know, I've we write some things and then like 15 years later, it's like, oh my gosh, how did I write that? Um, there's, you know, we all change our minds I, and, or we all try something on and then it doesn't quite work. So no, they would probably agree that, you know, I, I'm an old school lefty that, you know, I believe that wealth inequality is not a good thing. I think it's bad that there are X number of billionaires that run everything. I think it's bad that, um, Amazon sells 57%, I believe, of the books. And I, I think that that is worth discussing in the United States. I think that's worth discussing. What are the social effects of that? 
Um, I am, my life is devoted to protecting wild nature and, um, you know, wild, wild places and wild beings. And I mean, I think they would probably agree with some of that. I don't, I don't know, but, but that's part of the problem is that at this point, queer theory has colonized, um, almost all of the left and, um, and more broadly, postmodernism has colonized so much of the left that I think it's, I know this is getting a bit off topic, but, but I know so many people like myself who are old school lefties who don't even recognize what the left has become and are horrified and appalled and are, um, really consider ourselves politically homeless because there are, I mean, I don't think I'm alone in saying that both the left and the right are, are th those terms are getting almost, uh, almost obsolete in some ways or obsolete might be too strong, but they're, they're, Oh, they're getting queered. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about that. So a couple of things. So um, I had I had mentioned to you in Yolo County, California, we currently have a lawsuit. Uh, the librarian there uh, shut down one of our meetings. Our chapter chair had invited um, a couple different people to come in and speak um, about uh, men playing in women's sports and female sports. And the librarian didn't like what was being said and shut the whole meeting down, uh, kicked everyone out. And so there's currently a case. Um, being had there, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, it's happening all over the country, Derek, uh, where our moms are either being denied um, access to libraries um, or um, there are uh, a lot of different things that are being done. I, I came across a Reddit thread that had a number of, of strategies and different ways where they could keep Moms for Liberty uh, from using libraries or make it very uncomfortable for us. Um, and, you know, before we came on, you were talking about librarians and how much respect you have for librarians and, and how they were, you know, an important group in the past. I share um, that feeling, although I was on school board, and I have to be honest with you, when librarians uh, didn't stand up and, and fight the computers in the library, and the idea that their name was changed from librarian to media center specialist, um, that was when I got a little confused about you know, this, this organization as a whole and what it meant to be a librarian, because you would have expected that they would have pushed back a bit harder um, at that turn, right? Yeah. And the, the reason I'm sort of shaking my head weird is that, that there, I had some very good experiences with librarians when I was younger and they were sort of the bastions of free speech. And you go to them with some obscure question and they, they were a point of entree into these, these huge worlds contained within all these books and their 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 job was to help you find information not to you know hide books or not to and and but but it's a little bit more complicated than that because i do remember um being in a library in 1991 or 1990 somewhere in there in spokane where i lived at the time and uh there was a group of very clearly alternative students in the library, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, ones, this is their last chance. And there was, a a librarian there, there, I happened to be at the, the, the computer card catalog when they were, when the librarian was sort of introducing them. And, um, they, I remember the librarian said, so uh, uh, there was this one kid who, had a bandana and a little, you know, sort of a teenage goatee and really sort of a tough kid. And the librarian is talking about how you can learn about anything. And the kid I could see started getting excited about, oh my gosh, I can like look up. And I was just watching this fascinating because this kid was just stereotypical, not interested in stuff. And so the librarian said, so give me any example. Just I'll look up something for you. What do you want to know about? And the kid said, guns. Of course. And the librarian just stared at him for a second and then said, 
anybody else. Ooh. And this one girl said, whales. He said, yeah, I'll look up whales. And I thought, man, you just destroyed this kid's interest. If I would have been a librarian, I'd be like, yeah, let's look up guns. What do you want to know? Do you want to know like historical guns? Do you want to know guns of World War II? I, I don't. So, I mean, if a kid wants to learn like that, so, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's mixed, but back to the original point, librarians traditionally were some of the at least supposed to be bastions of free speech and that is not happening now. No. And I think that the whole issue of books has become, and this idea of book banning has become like a political bludgeon that's being used. You know, you may be familiar with Moms for Liberty addressing some of the books that we found in the libraries. And then we can talk a bit about why are these books coming into the libraries? Because that's really been our question, Derek. You know, why this so many books with all this explicit content coming into the libraries? The head of the American Library Association is a woman named Emily Drabinsky. I've asked her to come on the podcast. She refuses to come. Um, she is a uh, lesbian, which I could care less about. Who she has sex with is not my business. Um, she's a self-proclaimed Marxist, however, which is a bit more concerning uh, to me, right? And, and to moms in general. And so she wrote a paper called Queering the Catalog. I think that was in 2013 um, and uh, went into great detail. Our friend James Lindsay did a, a podcast about that. Um, but this, this, this idea of queering the catalog of the library and, and the books that are in the, in the schools and, and queer theory in general, I want to talk about this because I think queer theory is something that was completely new to me as of a couple of years ago. It was not something I knew anything about and I know there are a lot of moms that are listening to us have this conversation right now, and they are really wondering, you know, this, it's LGBTQ, so LGB, sexual orientation, this private, you know, I, th I continue to say the least interesting thing about an elementary school student should be their sexual orientation. Um, we should be opening up the world to them and getting them excited about learning. Um, children go through a latency period in their in their sexual development um, in, the, in the ages when they're in elementary school, and we shouldn't be fighting against that. We should be leaning into it. It's an important part of their time and development and learning. Uh, there's plenty of time for sex uh, in, in people's lives, right? Childhood is, is pretty fleeting. Um, but beyond that, um, these books... So I just did an interview and I read from some of these books and, and some of the books, Derek, are, are very descriptive. Um, we look at comprehensive sex education in the schools, um, talking about children having the right to sexual pleasure. So this idea of children having sexual citizenship, like somehow if we're not awakening this critical consciousness in the child in the classroom and um, you know, sexualizing them, making, making this world of sexuality come alive for them, that we're somehow denying them something. And so I would, I wanted to have you on to explain to us a little bit what you've learned about queer theory. I'm glad to. Um, I want to tell a quick story about children and sex that just cracks me up, which is I have a good friend who has two children, one of whom is in college and the other one is, they're, they're both college age now. And when she sat them down when they were, however old you are when you sit down children to have the... The, the sex talk about, you know, what, where babies come from. Um, it was so funny. So she explained to both of them at the same time that, you know, where, how they were made as, as babies. And one of them said, they, they, they took it all in. They were kind of appalled. And then one of them said, so turned to the other one and said, oh my gosh, that means mom and dad have done this. And the other one said, twice. twice. <laughs> and I, I think that's, mm. I, I, I think that's developmentally appropriate. Um, you know, like you said, there's plenty of time, but now to get to the queer theory thing, to talk about queer theory. Well, first off, most of us, I think, think that queer theory just means don't be mean to gays and lesbians. And that's not actually what it means. That's, um, in fact, some of the primary opponents of queer theory have been from the beginning, gays and especially lesbians. Um, now, having said that, uh, let's talk about what it is. And to talk about queer theory, we first have to talk about postmodernism. 
And I know that that sounds like gobbledygook, but I'll try to make it painless. Um, postmodernism starts with a great question and answered it in the stupidest way possible. And the great question is, how do you know what's real? If you have competing narratives, if you have compete, different people have different perspectives, how do you know what's real? And this is how courts work. The, the prosecuting attorney says he's guilty. The defense attorney says he's not guilty. And then it's the job of people. You've got these different stories. How do you figure out what's real? Um, this is what referees do in basketball. You know, a basketball player falls down and says, I got pushed. And the other player says, no, I didn't push him. And the referee has to figure out what actually happened. Um, it's true with parenting. You know, little Jimmy says that Jane ate the, the cupcake. And Jane says, Jimmy ate the cupcake. And it's up to the parent to figure out who's got chocolate on their face. Right. But the truth is that somebody ate the cupcake. Somebody ate the cupcake. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe the parent doesn't care. Maybe it's like, I'm too tired whatever it doesn't matter but the point is there is some reality but but we don't know what and the same thing happens politically that at one point uh the dominant story was that Christopher Columbus is a great hero and now the dominant story is that Christopher Columbus was a slaver colonizer and horrible and i mean it doesn't matter what we're talking about it can be that uh dropping atomic bombs on Japan was a complete atrocity is one narrative Another narrative is that uh, because the Japanese were going to fight so fiercely, that saved lives. And my point is not to endorse any of these. My point is just this is, it's part of life. Life is more complex than we're capable of perceiving. So, of course, we all have these stories that we, that we tell. And postmodernism asks, postmodernism asks, with all these stories out there, how do we know what's true? That's a great question. The stupid answer postmodernism gives is there is no such thing as truth. And there is no reality underlying. There is only these narratives. It's, it makes me wonder whether humans are sentient. It, I, I, it, I wish I was making this up, but it's, this is, that's the answer they come up with, is there are only these stories. And... They don't even believe this crap because if they believe this crap, I dare any postmodernist in the world to walk to the edge of a cliff and tell me and take one step forward and then tell me at the bottom that there is no such thing as physical reality. That it's only so there was this, this, uh, when I taught at Eastern Washington University, there was a, um, a philosopher, a postmodern philosopher, had an office right next to mine. We used to get in arguments all the time that he would say, because humans assign value to things, that's the only value they have. And if humans don't assign value, they don't have any value. So he said, whales have no inherent value. They are only valued because we value them. And I always was, I never would do this, of course, but I was always tempted to bring a hammer into his office and smash him in the thumb and say, you not getting in the, hit in the, hit in the thumb with a hammer has value no matter what you say. Um, and another way that this works is I, uh, about, about 1989, I, I was at dinner with a friend of mine who's a, who's a woman who was dating a postmodern philosopher, so she was temporarily insane. And at some point in the, in the conversation, I happened to say something about rape being a bad thing. And she said, no, we can say that rape is a bad thing, but that's based on the stories we tell each other. And it's not inherently, nothing is inherently good or bad. There are only these stories. And that's the insanity to which postmodernism leads. Okay, so that's postmodernism. That's fine, Derek. Where's queer theory? So queer theory is an offshoot of postmodernism that, uh, again, starts with a really good question and answers it in a terrible way. And the question that's really good is, how did things that are considered normal become considered normal? It's a great question. How did a wage economy get to be considered normal? How did um, paying rent get to be considered normal? How did kings or queens get to be considered normal? How did, um, you know, you can name anything you want. How did, how did our reliance on technology? Oh, like I was talking to this guy the other day and uh, he was telling me about a friend of his who had 
his girlfriend had broken up with him and they were both sitting on the couch texting to break up with each other. And, um, and he asked the guy, how, why, why didn't you just talk? And he said, well, that would have been too awkward. And so how did that become normalized? I don't think that's normal. I don't think that's normal. <laughs> like, I'll go back for a second. Some of the other stuff, but that's still not normal. Okay. Um, we can ask this, you know, about how did corporations having more value than human beings, how did that get normalized? So it's a great question. And they're really focused on sex. How did certain things get to be considered normal? How did certain things get to be considered not normal? And why are they focused on sex? The honest answer? Yeah. A lot of the creators of uh, a lot of the creators of queer theory were uh, open and acknowledged uh, fetishists, and they were creating an ideology to rationalize their fetishes. I was I was hoping to get there later, Sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, because that's that that I mean it's simply well, true. We can go there again. It's the truth. It's it's a lot of what we see is adults vicariously working out their their stuff uh, through. Well, that's another thing that's really important is that, um, and this again is, well, let let me say what queer theory is, and then we'll get to to why. So so, they argue how did certain things become normal and get considered normal? And how does certain things get to be considered not normal? And great question, again, and a great question about sex too. Um, but their answer is that um, all forms of normality are inherently oppressive. So anything that is considered normal is inherently harmful to the people who participate in that minority behavior. So um, anybody, so, and, and another part of it is that because strictures against homosexuality, against um, lesbianism, any, because those strictures are uh, harmful, Therefore, all strictures against all forms of sexuality are harmful. And that's nonsense. And and you, have, you have gays against groomers, Jamie Michelle, who started gays against groomers. You have a, a very large segment of, of gay people across America, adults saying, wait a second, you know, you're, you're doing this transference of, you know, using our rights to, to be able to live freely and to be able to marry, to be tolerated within a society, right, that accepts pluralism and that and you're using all of those freedoms that we fought for and you're, you're, per, you're perverting them into this, this place where now all of a sudden pedophilia or bestiality or all of these other things are supposed to be acceptable too. Yes. Um, that have real harms. Yes. Not just two consenting adults making a decision. Yes. And, and even among consenting adults, I would argue, as, as Arthur Evans, who was a great gay writer in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I would argue, as he did, that even among consenting adults, for every action we do, we have to ask, what are the social implications of that action? And that applies to sexuality as well. And the example, one of the examples he uses is Pat Califia, who is a sort of queer theory icon. Um, and who, by the way, she, she has written, she's my queer theory pedophilia 300 answer. Um, she has written child torture porn involving a mother sexually torturing her daughter. And she's written that any child old enough to decide whether or not she wants to wear shoes is old enough to decide whether she wants to have sex. And by which she doesn't mean play doctor at all. She means sex with adults. And Oh, because she's also said that pedophilia or pedophiles should be encouraged to spend time with children. Um, and again, I'm not making this stuff up. Queer theory um, basically argues that uh, all forms of sexuality are themselves oppressed, and there can be, uh, and all norms are inherently oppressive, and that's why they cannot that's why there are no major queer theorists 
who can definitively come out against even things like pedophilia or bestiality. Because if they do, then that means that their entire thesis that all forms of sexuality are oppressed and that all norms are oppressive is called into question. And instead, we enter into adult discussions of what forms of sexuality we think are okay and what aren't. Because they're, again, their point is all forms of sexuality are acceptable. And I mean, I, I need to get this in. Judith Butler is probably the most famous uh, living queer theorist. And she has argued that prohibitions against parent child incest should be, quote, revisited. Uh, because she says there are times when the prohibitions against parent child incest are not protections against uh, harm, but instead the agent of harm. Because what they argue, the, the fundamental argument of queer theory is it is not the act, remember this is all postmodernism, it's not the actual act of an adult, we're going to go value neutral here for a second, the adult having sexual contact with a child, because they would never say the adult is raping the child, which is what you and I would say, what normal people would say. But they would say that the act of an adult having sexual contact with a child is not what causes the harm. Again, I'm not making this up. This is straight Foucault. Instead, they would argue that it is the discourse surrounding that that makes the child feel ashamed, that makes the child feel harmed. That if there wasn't discourse telling the child, oh, this is harmful, the child would not feel harm and would. And in fact, they argue, you are oppressing a child by saying that that child is not allowed to explore his or her sexuality with an adult. That's and what comprehensive sex education says. I mean, in the right to sexual citizenship, that you are denying the child their right to sexual pleasure. Um, so I want to. I want to say a, a couple things about this. One is that NAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association, has has argued that most uh, adult child sexual interactions are initiated by the child. And I know that you and I can both say that's horrifying, but I want to tell another story about this that ties into all of this, which is back in the eighties, I was living in Nevada and my sister's husband, I would go with him sometimes to the dump. And one time we went and there was the sister's husband in the driving, in the truck, a bench seat. And then my six-year-old or four, my four-year-old niece is in between us. My six-year-old niece is on my left leg and her friend is on my right leg, six-year-old friend. And you know, I, I had nieces. I, you know, I'm used to kids crawling all over me and that's all, you know, it's fine. It's we're, we're primates, you know, we crawl on each other and, and that's all fine. But the little girl, her friend was really creepy because she sort of squared herself on my leg so I could feel her genitals. And then she, uh, started like really, and I've had kids play with my hands, you know, that, that's another thing they do, but she was like really if if she would have been 25, I would have thought she was coming on to me. It's just, and I didn't understand what was going on because I was very young and naive. I just knew it was creepy. So I shifted her so that she couldn't square her genitals on my leg and so that she couldn't reach my hand anymore. And so we go to the dump and back. And then I didn't say anything to anybody because I didn't, I was still, I was too young to understand. Now, of course I would say stuff, but it, the news broke in town about a month later that she was being raped by her big brother. And I got it. Yeah, it's she like, to like her. She thought that was like the way that she was engaging with you. She was, she had been groomed. Oh. So the point here is that when children are acting in a sexualized fashion, um, that is not a sign that they are being oppressed and they need to be able to express this, that is a sign that somebody needs to look at their relatives and the their babysitter flag. and their teacher and, you know, whomever in their life. Um, to so, that point, so to that point, Derek, no, I was just going to say, so you've got this, this education, this, you know, 
the the idea of queering something, I said the queering the catalog, this idea that, you know, anything that becomes normal is now must be, uh, now isn't, oh, isn't wait, good wait. anymore. Right? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Wait, no, they're hip. No, no, no. I'm I'm the one who who interrupted you. Um, no, see, they're, they're hypocrites anyway because queer theory at this point has become normalized. Right. And there was a there was a queer theorist, one of the people who popularized queer theory. I don't remember her name, but she abandoned queer theory in 1993 because it was so much accepted among academia. It's like at least she's not a hypocrite because. If they were being true to themselves, then now that it's been normalized, they would have to denounce it. But they don't because because they're postmodernists and because it's really all about power. It's not about reality. It's not. It's about using whatever argument you can to advance your whatever your agenda is. So Which when of gay course marriage is, when gay marriage was made legal, that really screwed them up. I mean, it, it, that that meant that we had to go to the next level or the next thing because all of a sudden it had been accepted by society is that kind of how we get to this place where you see queer theory kind of exploding well that's one of the ways and another way is i don't understand how the queer theorists don't see this there's this guy um guy de back in the 60s wrote this thing about the society of the spectacle and the short version of that is that if you remove relationship from things then the spectacle has to get bigger and bigger and bigger to keep it from getting boring. So, for example, you know, baseball or football or any of those, it used to be good enough to just watch the sport, but now they got to have jumbotrons and then they got to have like TVs in front of, you know, every, every little bit so you can see all the replays. It's, it's just, it, you have to keep upping the stake so it doesn't get boring. And if I can get a little bit graphic, um, there was, I really got this with, uh, this really good book called, and the band played on, which is by Randy Schiltz about the early age crisis. I've read it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. And, and his response and the band playing on is not just the government's lack of response to AIDS, but also the, the gay community's lack of response to AIDS and how they just kept playing on, even though they're, they're dying. And there was a scene in there where he's talking about the gay bathhouses and how he saw some extreme, extreme forms of sex, like somebody sticking his arm all the way up somebody else's behind. And he was the one who made the point. It's where I, reading that book is where I got it, that if you remove all relationship from sex, if you remove all emotion from sex, and it, it start, even sex starts to get boring. So you have to add, and you have to keep violating boundaries. You have to move this boundary here. And then that gets boring. So you have to move this boundary here. Um, Gail Dines and Lear Keith at one point interviewed some uh, pedophiles imprisoned in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, it was Massachusetts. And one of the things they were saying is that this is just sort of the classic porn escalation because you start with this porn and then that gets boring after a while. I mean, how many times can you just see you know, the same thing. So then you got to up the stakes and they got up the stakes because there's no relationship. Human interactions, actual human interactions, we're infinitely complex. So, you know, you can still, there are still things to learn, you know, 20, 30 years in a relationship. So it's so interesting you say that. James Lindsay, I asked once, um, I said, what's with Epstein Island? What's with all these guys, these men going and wanting to be with these younger girls on this island. And he said, well, I guess if you have everything and everything just becomes like normal and you can have access to anything, then you want something that isn't normal and accessible to most people. And and it does seem to kind of align with that, right? Yep, absolutely. That's And that's the thing is, is you finish one thing and then you've got to break the boundaries again. This interview has taken an interesting turn. I want to get back to the schools. <laughs> I'm going to put a content warning on this one, but I want to get back to the schools. Or you can Jared, cut it. I don't care. No, no, no. But I do want to get back to the schools because something that you've talked about before is the keeping of secrets, right? So you mentioned this interaction you have with this young girl where you recognize something's off. You're young, so you don't necessarily know, but then you see that she is being violated. You are a survivor of abuse. Um, so you certainly, I mean, it must have kind of been jarring to you to make that connection and then to see, I mean, any child being violated by an adult, in my opinion, is just completely unacceptable. 
Um, interestingly, we get these weird people on Twitter who, when we call out some of the things we're seeing happening in schools and we talk about the idea of grooming, they'll always put up like pictures of like pastors that have sexually abused children and say, but this is okay with you. Uh, side note to any, everyone watching, it's not okay. I don't care who, who is sexually abusing children. It's completely unacceptable, whether they're a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, or whatever. Um, but the keeping secrets part. I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the schools and where queer theory fits into this. So we have books in the libraries that the moms are reading out loud. Adults are horrified. Adults are shutting down meetings. They're cutting off our mics. Um, I, I've done CBS Sunday morning. They won't show the books and won't read from the books. I just recorded 60 Minutes and read to Scott Pelley from the books. I doubt that they're going to actually air it. Um, so no one actually wants to confront what's in these books, but these books are certainly available to our children in school and parents are concerned. It's K through 12 public school. This isn't a public library. This is a school. Um, and you curate content as a librarian in general. So you have to ask yourself what you know educational value are these books giving to students in school? And, and no one's banning books, to be clear, for anyone listening. You know, write the book, print the book, publish the book, sell the book, put the book anywhere you want to put it, um, but perhaps not in the hands of a, of a child. Um, but the secret part, Derek, the fact that we have gender ideology that now is being taught in schools. And I'd like to talk a little bit about queer theory and how we get to gender ideology and how that plays into this conversation. But the fact that you've got schools that are keeping secrets from parents, you've got you know, schools that are have, have staff members and they're meeting with kids behind closed doors, talking to them about what pronouns do you want to use at school? What name do you want to be called? What name do you want us to use when we're talking to your parents? What bathroom do you want to use? Where do you want to sleep on field trips? With the, do you want to sleep with the opposite sex on field trips? So you have this situation where schools are saying, like, listen, home may not be safe. We're safe. Trust us right? Your chosen family. Trust us. And so what does that tell you? How does that play into queer theory and, and what's happening right now across the country? Um, a, a couple things. One of them is that um, what you're describing about not being allowed to say those to, to read the books that the, the mic gets cut off when you read these things to adults is that's, this is what happened with one of my publishers that um, he severed the relationship with me because I wrote a chapter on queer theory and saying the things, you know, quoting Judith Butler, quoting Michelle Foucault, quoting um, Pat Califia, quoting all of them. And he said it was hateful of me to do this. And it was, um, he, he had a, a, a very interesting line in there. He said, oh, he compared it to anti-Semitism and racism. Um, and he had an interesting line. He said, I can't, nothing you say here is not true, but it's a misuse of truth. And, and, and then he severed the relationship with me. And wouldn't not only not he not only not publish that book, but would never publish anything of mine again. And I I don't. Um, that's why that's why I say that that among some parts of the left at this point, queer theory is holy, and it it can't be it cannot be spoken of. It it must be taken in a whole. And anyway, so I had the same thing in personal, and I don't even know what misuse of truth is. Um, it's it's very clear. It's just another side note. It's very clear that a lot of this is 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 a secular religion, and what you're doing, and what I'm doing, and what other people are doing is is not merely exposing something, but we're committing blasphemy. And um, it's it's it it has a religious fervor to it that I find frustrating and disturbing. This is a nice way. And so, so back to the other about secrets, um, Judith Herman talked about in, I believe, father, daughter incest, she talked about how if there was one thing, one little thing she could change about society that would reduce sex, childhood sexual abuse, it was to imbue children with the understanding that if anybody ever asks you to keep a secret, that you tell everyone. And this applies not only to 
I mean, this applies to the schools, obviously, that if a school tells you to keep a secret, you tell everyone. And, you know, they, they make this claim that uh, the, the, the children will be in danger. You know, the, the father might beat them if they act too girly or something. And the solution to that is if your father threatens to beat you because you're acting too girly, then you need to tell everybody. And yeah, and, and then, teachers are mandatory reporters. If they know that a child is being abused at home or they truly feel that there's a, a reason that abuse might occur, then they have a responsibility yep. to share that. Yep. But you and know, they the should... idea that a parent has a religion that might go against gender ideology is not evidence of abuse. Except in California. Um, right. Thank you, Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was being sarcastic just for people <laughs> in the audience. Um, it's, it's, I think it is at atrocious that schools are going, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say except that, except that it is, um, except that if any adult tells any child to keep a secret that is anything beyond this is what we're getting mom for Christmas. Um, you need to tell everyone immediately. And I mean, this is what, this is what you say. If an adult is going to, uh, you know, if, if the neighbor, I mean, this was true when I was a kid, you know, if the neighbor was going to feed me dinner, you know, I would tell my mom, this is just, and, and that wasn't even anything weird. You know, it's like, well, and I also think, Derek, that there's a segment of society, I mean, there's no doubt that 30 years ago, it was much harder to come out as gay, right? Even in your own home, right? There were, it was, there were a lot of, of different things that came into play or embarrassment on, by the family if their child was gay. And so I have no doubt that it was much, much harder. I, I don't want to discount that. But that's not today. That's not 2023 in America. You know, the idea that anyone's going to tell my child I, I've said before that my children do not need a sexual spirit guide at school. Like, you know, the idea that, you know, but you have these adults that are like, well, I was abused as a child or I was, you know, I was treated badly by my parents. So now I need to go and write this memoir manifesto in order to save kids who might deal with the same experience. But it, it's not this, it's 2023. It's not 2003 or, you know, 1993. Well, and great, write your memoir in any case, but that doesn't alter the fact that you shouldn't we said this before we we went on air but i'll i'll say it again that my my mom back in the early 70s when there were big fights about whether gays or lesbians should be allowed to teach which i think is horrible that they wouldn't be allowed to teach if if that's all it is um but in the fights about that my mom's attitude was always i don't care if the teacher is gay or straight i don't want my children knowing anything about their sexuality and I, the only thing I remember about any, even remotely about any teachers, anything to do with their sexuality when I was a kid is my fourth grade teacher got married. And the only reason we knew that is because she changed her name. That's it. So Miss Harms became Mrs. Har. That's, that's end of story. There was nothing about sex. And I'm sorry to be an old fogey, but I'm seeing reading comprehension go down. I'm seeing math comprehension go down. I'm seeing that in Port in Oregon now, uh, they're no longer requiring basic reading comprehension to graduate. Yeah. Um, and basic understanding of history, basic understanding. And I'm not even talking about theories on history. It's not, I mean, I'm talking about not knowing what century the American Civil War is or was. And I don't, so a, I don't think there's, I don't think there's time. You know, there's, there's not time to do this other crap, and and not when. Oh, and what is it in San Francisco? They're reducing it so that I, I don't know. They're no longer teaching algebra two or algebra. It's like maybe no, no longer algebra in junior high. I think that's it. And this is, this is nuts. And I'm sorry to be an old fogey. You I don't know think what? Fogey. I mean, <laughs> when I was in, when I was, when I was in high school, um, when I was in high school, I remember in one class, we had to read 20 tragedies, um, running from the ancient Greeks up to, you know, all my sons and, um, Arthur Miller. And, uh, we had to, 
and, and, and frankly, it still wasn't that hard. I mean, it's still just high school, but I'm, we did get, we, I was, I was talking to this guy the other day about, about what, what literature is taught in high school. And it's like, we read the Scarlet Letter, we read um, Crime and Punishment, we read, and I don't know, it's like, okay, if you do all those, and then you've got time to talk about gender woo, you know, then, then you can do it. But, well, no, then we still have other questions to talk about with it. But I, I wouldn't, I was thinking about that this morning. I wouldn't have a problem having a class on this whole gender business as long as it was a class that taught it critically. That taught, I mean, it, well. I think, it's, I think that we get into the conversation about academic freedom in general, or, or this idea of, you know, of, of K through 12 space, whether academic freedom really exists within that space. I mean, there's, there are certain, there are certain places that discussion like that should be happening, but in the K through 12 space, there are standards that are, are clearly outlined for the teacher to follow. Right. And so I think we get in this blurry area where we have like AP classes and certain things coming into uh, to, to the K through 12 space, like that are entering into um, you know, one of the things that was a real uh, that, of course, the media and, and the teachers unions like to try to kind of pervert everything. But in the AP um, African-American studies class, gender theory was introduced in that class. And that was something that wasn't even discussed because, of course, it was, oh, Ron DeSantis doesn't want African-American history taught. But that wasn't the case at all. It had injected gender theory into the conversation and into the class. And I, and I feel pretty strongly about when you're talking about K through 12 space. You need to teach facts. That's important, you know. And, and biological sex is a fact. Okay, no, okay. I don't. I don't disagree. I mean, my career has been destroyed because I <laughs> d- ag- agree that biological reality is real. So, right. so we're not actually disagreeing. When I uh, the, the key word that I said was critical. So, if right. you want to have a discussion, because it's a big issue these days. If you want to have a discussion, then what that means is you have to talk about what. what a, I completely agree with you. I mean, I probably shouldn't even have gone there because it's a it's a complete sideline where what really should be taught is sorry, reading, writing, and arithmetic and calculus and and other things that are actually that are real. I mean, you shouldn't be getting too much into philosophy. But but if we want to go in the AP classes, then we can we can have a discussion about that. But the key word I was saying there was critical, where you present. I mean, I don't have a problem with us talking about queer theory because when you expose what queer theory actually is, it falls apart. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with – what I have a problem with is propagandizing pro-queer theory and basically lying about it. I don't have a problem with discussing – it's the same with the whole – all the, the, the gender stuff is that – well, there. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question first. When we say, or when I say, the word gender stuff, what do we even mean? Right. I don't know. Gender's like personality, <laughs> a million different well, flavors. So. I know exactly. So, like, if that's what they want to talk about, if 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 a gender if a gender study, that's another big problem. Is that in colleges they've changed it from women's studies to gender studies? That's when everything was lost, frankly. But leave that aside. Um, Oh God, we still have, we're still something on queer theory we have to talk about, but. Um, we can go back to that now. We can go back. I, I just think it's, in the K through 12 space, I just don't think we discuss enough the fact that, first of all, I believe gender ideology has no place in public schools. I just do not believe it has any place in public schools. I know the history of it. I know John Money, Dr. Kinsey, the, the, the things that have happened. I, I, you know, you look at this idea of gender affirming care, where for the first time in, 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 the, in all of history, we're supposed to believe that pharmaceutical companies are going to help us to be our true selves. It's absolutely ridiculous. No child is born in the wrong body. Children are not going to be blockers. All the things, right? So, gonna- so when, okay, I want to be really clear here that when I was saying that they could do some gender studies stuff in high school, that's what I was talking about them saying. Right. I wasn't saying promoting it. I was saying having a critical look at it. Right. So, so I just want to be clear on that. So, no, so. and I think we should have more. There's a, there's a, if for people that are listening to the podcast, I did a really great uh, podcast with the people that started the Paradox Institute, and they do some great videos. And one of the things that they really address is this idea of intersex and the fact that, you know, because there are a certain percentage of 
people that are born with, um, you know, anomaly, right? Anomalies. And I think it's important for us to have compassion and empathy. And you're right. I, I think that we should have honest conversations about this issue because it does fall apart when you actually have conversations about it. No child is born in the wrong body. It's a horrible thing uh, to, to think, right? And and to, to say to a child. Um, and and we then you have the living in service of something that can never be true. You can't change your sex. You can dress as a different sex. You can cut off and mutilate your body, but it's still never going to make you a woman or me a man. It's just not. I agree with you. The other part of queer theory is that they are trying to queer binaries. So th- what they're saying is that, um, that if men oppress women, then the way to solve that is not to recognize that there is a class called men who are oppressing a class called women, but instead to queer it so that there are no classes of men and women anymore. Which is, I mean, so there is a class of rich people and a class of poor people, and the rich people are oppressing the poor. No, we're just going to queer the binaries so that there's no rich and no – it, it doesn't – but that's this is – now, and That's what's happening now in America. There will just be elite people who would decide everything for us. It's, it's this, 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 this whole thing. So the, the way – and Judith Butler actually argues this. She argues that the way to stop men's oppression of women is to – queer the binary so that there is no such thing as man or women and for lesbians to have sex with men. Like, I'm sorry, this is just back to the old corrective rape of the 1950s. This is, it's, anyway, so I wanted to say that that's another part of this is they're, they, 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 they think that they're queering all these binaries and they're actually queering, well, they are in fact queering the truth lie binary. Um, and they're queering the violence, nonviolence bi- binary by saying that your words are violence, but their threats of violence against you are not violence. And, and one of the things we need to recognize, there's a great line about dating, which is if, if, if people say bad things about themselves on the first date, believe them. And it's true for all this too. If the postmodernists say there is no reality, and that discourse is all about power, believe them, because they will then do anything to impose that power. Um, And I want to come back to the whole fetish thing that we talked about a long time ago to sort of finish that part too, Um, that now that we've introduced queer theory, and I hope this is somewhat comprehensible, um, that um, part of the reason that they developed it in the first place is Michel Foucault was, was raping boys as he was writing a philosophy to support the sexual abuse of children. And Pat, Cal- or Pat Califia and Gail Rubin were both open sadomasochists. And I am sorry, but I believe that a significant portion of the way we use, we collectively use our intelligence is to rationalize whatever we wanted to do in the first place. Mm. And so Michel Foucault, in many ways, was simply arguing in favor of his fetish and yeah, constructing to justify to himself that he wasn't actually harming children, because I think intrinsically and inherently humans know, adults know that children are not sexual beings. I I just well, it's it, and this is this is a really important point. Also, is that nobody, nobody, Robert J. Lifton wrote this about mass murder, but it's true for a lot of things too, or almost everything. That nobody can commit mass murder without first convincing themselves that what they're doing is actually good. Right. And nobody, he called them claims to virtue, and it's the same with. No matter what we talk, I mean, it's true on a personal level. I've never once in my life been a jerk. You know, every time I have objectively been a jerk, I've had it fully rationalized. You know, <laughs> they totally deserved it because, you know. Because they did it to me first or what have you. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I mean, we, we're really good at rationalization. And, and that's what's happening with all this. They have a claim to virtue. We have to protect the kids. We have to protect the kids as they are grooming the kids. We have and, to fully allow the children to become who they're meant to be and 
adult keeping them from having sex with us or just keeping them from who they really want to be. It, it, th- those are the selfish adults. I'm the one who's liberating. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which, again, this is absolutely standard human behavior to rationalize right. whatever you want. I'm not, I'm not attacking them. For, I'll attack them for plenty of things, but not that because everybody does that. Sure. Um, but I think it's important for us to recognize that that's what they're doing, that they're going to think we're the good guys. Because nobody ever wants to think, oh, my God, are we the bad guys? Um, anyway, so there's that. And then the other thing is queer theory is very clear to me is basically unmetabolized trauma and is basically um, the – I mean, do I need to go on about that? I, I, it's the, the, the trauma, childhood trauma especially, can cause certain predictable – Responses. Yeah, experiences. Yep. I- and one of them is that you come to believe that all relationships are based on power and that fully mutual relationships are not possible. I'm sorry. Can we see the relationship between that and sadism? Can we see the relationship between that and postmodernism where um, you believe that there is no reality, but there's only the stories and who has more power is the one who tells the stories. I mean, that, that is describing a, a dissociated child who then doesn't metabolize it, grows up to become an adult and passes on. I mean, that's how trauma is, is uh, passed on generation to generation through that unmetabolized trauma-based behavior. And to that point with like some of the books, there's a book called All the Boys Aren't Blue by a gentleman named George Johnson who um, had a family member who ate in his book. And um, I read one, that passage to the reporter the other day. Um, and one of the things that George has said is, you know, well, I wrote this because I want to help other kids who are going through this. And it's an extremely graphic passage. Um, I've asked some different child psychologists, you know, what is it, if you're discussing this in the classroom or if this child just comes across this book, is it going to be very triggering for them? Is this actually helping a child? And the question becomes, and and I've said, you know, if the best thing that we're doing to help children who are being sexually assaulted is throwing a book on a library shelf and crossing our fingers and hoping that they're going to come across it and somehow it's going to help them to go through this process, I mean, shame on us as a society in general, right? I mean, this idea you know, that you, I mean, it's hurt people, hurt people, you know, and this guy's been very hurt and he's going to write about the pain that he's had. Um, but is that the best intervention for a child who's experiencing that harm? Um, as a mom, I'm going to say probably not, but. Well, one of the brilliant parts of rape culture is that it eroticizes oppression and it combines the drive for power which is a very strong drive. I mean, look at people conquering other countries. And it combines that with the sexual drive, which is a very strong drive. And it, um, when you combine the drive for power with the power of the orgasm, it, um, it creates a self-reinforcing cycle that um, if unrecognized and if unarticulated, if you don't articulate what's going on, if you don't tell the trauma story, as Judith Herman says, then, as you said, hurt people hurt people. And when you... So much of queer theory, I mean, I, I find it, horrifying and awful. And if they weren't causing so much harm, it would also just make me profoundly sad because what I'm seeing is a lot of people with a lot of unmetabolized trauma who have literally made a fetish. And you see this all the time. They'll say, gosh, I was abused as a kid. Oh, you see this with pedophiles too. There's there's like... Allen Ginsberg talked about this and some other famous sort of pro pedo people have said, look, I was sex. No, I didn't say I was sexually abused. My first sexual encounter was when I was really young with an older guy. It didn't harm me at all. They say, is yes. they're sexually abusing children? 
Right. And it didn't harm me. Um, and that's part of the difficulty too. And again, this is not original to me, but the, as Judith Herman says, there is a complicated bond forms between perpetrator and victim. And especially when there's sexual abuse involved, whether you're an adult or a child, there's, there's a really important passage again from Judith Herman. And she's, she's quoting one of her, of her clients. And the client says that she had, and this is, she says it much better, but basically the client says that I realized that all these rape fantasies that I was having had been put into me by my father. And I realized that if he had put them into me, I could replace them with something else. Mm -hmm. And so over time, she got so that th those were no longer exciting to her and she was able to uh, change what excited her. But it took a conscious effort and it took years to, to undo. And it took the realization that it had been put into her and so needed to be taken out. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get to that realization of this was put into me, you just think like that little girl in Nevada, you know, that in another circumstance with somebody who was horrible, they would have thought, oh my God, she's coming on to me. She's expressing her sexuality. But no, what she was doing is desperately trying to tell the trauma story in the only way she knew how, which was through her body. And that is... That is the discussion I wish we were having as a society is, is why are there so many young women who hate their bodies enough that they want to cut off their perfectly healthy breasts? Yeah. And why, is we as, why are we as a society, and why, is we, why, are, why do we as a society hate women so much that we will force Female prisoners who the chances of them having been abused prior to going into prison are like 85% or 80% or some huge percent. Why are we forcing them to share spaces with males? There's a woman in California who is in the same prison with As the man the, who yep. murdered her children, murdered her children. And I've taught in prison. I taught in men's prison, but I've known a number of female prisoners, female ex-prisoners who have said, oh my God, it was so nice to be away from men's violence for a while. Prison was terrible, but, and I'm not saying that every man beats every woman, of course, but I'm saying that, that for some women, it has been something to be away from men for a time. And how much do we hate women that we can't even talk? How much, oh, here's another part I want to bring into this is that one of the things I think is horrible that goes all the way back to Aristotle is something called the great chain of being, which is a scale of perfection where at the top is God, who's perfectly disembodied. And then below that is angels. Then there's humans. And then there's uh, non-human animals, then plants, and then rocks, and then sand or something. I don't know. And humans are a battleground between mind and body. And the body is corrupt. And disembodied nature or disembodied God is perfect. And God's not the point here. Um, the point is that this is the idea that what, that the disembodied is perfect and the embodied is, is nothing. And this is Aristotle, you know, a couple thousand years ago. And the point I'm getting at is that also fits right in with gender ideology because what we think is important what our bodies are, are just a vessel for this mind that is, I can have a woman's, I can have a woman's mind in my male body and that makes me a woman. So, but that's not true. Please we show are. Me the man who knows what a woman's mind is to begin with, by the way. Oh, I know. I know. Complete nonsense. <laughs> Complete nonsense. We are our bodies. Yeah. And, um, you know, when, when, when my body dies, the rest of me is going to die too. We can talk about souls if we want, but that's not the point here. The point is that this whole gender ideology, the whole queer theory is, is profoundly, profoundly body hating and profoundly 
reality hating. That's why I brought up postmodernism. Um, there's a great line the other day. It was so funny. Uh, this was about a year ago. Um, Reese McKinnon, Veronica Ivy, whatever you want to call him, he's a, a trans activist. He was interviewed by Trevor Noah, and he kept saying, "I'm I'm a female. I'm a female." And you know how I know I'm a female, or you know how everybody knows I'm a female, is because my government papers say I'm a female. And this is why I don't have a lot of respect for journalists, because Trevor Noah just sort of nodded along. But I would have asked him, so are you saying that everything that's said on a government paper is real? Right. That everything, every government, every government document makes, makes something true. And if he was really a postmodernist, which he is, he would he would he would have to agree with that because because yes, there's only the stories, there's no reality. Um, but I find it really interesting that that we value what's on a piece of paper more than we value. And that's another thing we we I can't believe we've gone this entire interview. And we haven't used the word gaslighting. We can talk about that now. Let's talk about it now. So I'm a mom. I've told you I have four kids. I loved being pregnant. I think I never fully had an appreciation for my body before I got pregnant and I, you know, gave birth to a baby. It's pretty incredible that women are able to do. And it's, um, it's pretty wild, right? You feel it's, 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 it's something that continue that happens that you have some amount to do with, right? But really, it just it continues on as it wants to. Um, and so, you know, moms, I, I think, we, we have, whether you've, whether you've given birth or whether you're an adoptive mom, um, moms will do anything for their kids, um, will die for our children. Um, and, uh, you know, I challenge continuously, like I think teachers do love their kids and their, the kids in their classroom, but they're not their children, right? And our, our, our teacher, you know, teachers have 30 kids and then the next year they have another 30 kids, but parents, you know, that's your kid. And so moms and dads, as we've discussed this whole time, right, they're coming and they're speaking out and they're saying, don't tell my child that they were born in the wrong body or the doctor was somehow wrong. I think, you know, I think about how destabilizing it is to a child at five years old to be told that their parents might be wrong about something that seems to be a very, a fact to them, right? That is a, just something that's very true of their nature, that they're either a boy or a girl. And, and the idea that, they, that they're being told in the classroom that they could be a boy or a girl or neither or both or a tree that day or whatever it is that they're being told, right? Um, but as moms and dads are speaking out and speaking up, I mean, we've had the full force of the United States government come after us. We had the Department of Justice call us domestic terrorists. Um, we, the SPLC has designated us a, a hate group. They met with the Biden administration six times in advance of doing that. Um, and, you know, you talk about gaslighting, um, this idea of, oh, it's not happening. It's not happening. Oh, it's happening. Um, but it's only happening sometimes and then it's happening and it's really good that it's happening and it needs to keep happening. And that's like the cycle that parents are trapped in right now. And so how do we break out of that cycle? Well, a couple of things. One of them is I just, uh, you said the thing about this happening, you know, it's not happening. The, the, the puberty blockers and surgery and wrong sex hormones and everything else for children is such a great example of that, that it, it pivoted so quickly from it's not happening to stopping it is uh, human rights abuse. Right. And I, I, I honestly, I have, I, I have my problems and I have my, my weaknesses as a thinker and writer, but that level of personal cognitive dissonance would destroy me. I don't, I, I, I could not participate in that. Um, that I have certainly been wrong, but I don't, you know, the only way I can understand this is a great line by R.D. Lang, the psychiatrist, um, three rules of a dysfunctional family. Rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence of rules A, A1, or A2. And so within a, 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 a domestic violence within an abusive family, we can talk about anything we want except for the violence that we have to pretend isn't happening. Right. And nobody can break that silence. And it's the same thing with this. It's just, I, I don't, and yeah, it's, it's, it's all, um, it's all just profound gaslighting. And you didn't even get to, I think the worst gaslighting, worst, ga worst gaslighting is that, 
sex is a spectrum or that that um, um, there's such a thing as a female penis. I mean, that's, 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 I'm sorry, every single human who has ever been born is a result of a male sperm and a female egg. Every single one. That's what we, in the, what we I'm, a, I'm a physicist, and that's what we scientists call a large sample size. There's been 80 billion humans who have ever existed in the history of humanity. Every single one was a male sperm and a female egg. And I am offended that I've had to spend the last 10 years telling adults where babies come from. A hundred percent. And I said to Scott Kelly, when we were doing 60 Minutes, I said to him, I said, is it shocking to you, Scott, that parents would want to have the conversation with their children about how babies are made? Like when you really get down to the base level of this, right? And he said, whoa, he made me rephrase the question and I just repeated it. And then he said, um, oh, well, no, 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 it's not, it's not shocking. You know? And I was like, right, exactly. I mean, that when you really come down to what should sex education look like in school, you know, I think that, I think that there's conversation about, you know, sexual health, right? And and as kids are getting older and they're getting into sexual relationships, if they're having um, sexual relationships with, um, let's say they're a boy and they're having sexual relationships with another boy, I think it's important for them to be given information in order to be able to stay safe. And we can have a conversation about what age that should be happening. Um, I don't think it should be at the age of five, but the push of this down lower and lower and lower and lower. And this idea of comprehensive sex education, which is coming from really global, there's global influence, you know, UNESCO and the United Nations and um, International Planned Parenthood and all of these different groups that are pushing for all of this stuff to happen in schools. I'm at the point with sex ed. I'm like, just basic biological reproduction. That's it. That's all I want to discuss now. I feel like we've reached a level of insanity beyond, I mean, you know, Derek, I don't know if you know uh, and you've seen the latest sex education. Abstinence is not abstinence anymore. Abstinence is um, so if you're not going to have, you know, sex intercourse and, and, and it used to be, you know, here's how babies are made, right? And, and you know, use protection if you're going to have sex or don't have sex at all. Now it's, well, there are lots of other types of sex you could have. We can talk about mutual masturbation. We can talk about oral sex. We can talk about um, anal sex. We can talk, I mean, all this stuff. At what point are public school teachers giving children this, you know, a la carte menu of other sexual experiences in school? It's It's really crazy when you step back and you just think about the fact that, we're negating, you know, really teaching kids about biological reproduction properly. So a couple of things, again, that um, one is I feel like I was at the sweet spot of sex ed because it was in the 70s and they, it was part of our health class and we had two weeks and it was basically, here's what happens. Um, you know, basically here... And, and, you know, this is, this is what you do to prevent pregnancy. If you're right. going to have, it, it was, it was. And were the boys and the girls separate? Did they yeah. Get the t- yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that was fine. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that I think I can't speak from a parent's perspective because I'm not a parent, but there was, I think a, and I say this as someone who was sexually abused. So, you know, I had my own issues, but even as someone who was, who was, was abused and had issues, there is this profound beauty of fumbling around and learning about sex on your own. I mean, not, not necessarily on your own, but you know what I mean? I mean, but learning- yeah, even that. I mean, figuring out, figuring out, you know, how things work, and I don't We're stealing that from them, Derek. That's being stolen from that's children. That's exactly it. The joy of sex is being stolen from them. It's, it, it, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get graphic at all. Don't worry. But I still remember thinking, like, just. At, at some points going, that's how that works. Right. It, it, and just, you know, sort of having this awe at the universe. And that actually leads us to another thing that we haven't really talked about, that I, I don't understand how people, how doctors are not, I, I, I don't understand how there can be just casual discussion of mutilating 
young people's genitals or anybody's genitals for that matter. And the, and the operations are horrific. I mean, it is Mengele. It is it is ex- experimentation, horrible decay. Hor- I mean, oh. Well, at the very at the, and at the very least, I mean, a male does not end up with a vagina, and a female does not end up with a penis. They're not. They're not. That's that's part of it. For one thing, humans or anybody, and again, it could be a frog. It could be you know a fish. It doesn't matter. Bodies are not like chairs that you can disassemble and reassemble. There is this magic that is in the body itself. And yes, there are heart transplants. Yes, there are lung transplants. Yes, there are miracles that can happen, medical miracles that can happen. But you cannot construct a functioning penis and you, you you can't construct a functioning vagina i am horrified beyond words that we had an entire nation celebrating the public castration of a young boy on television i don't i don't i don't you know i you're talking about jazz jennings is that what you're yeah, talking about yeah yeah and i i i don't sex is one of those things that I think is holy by which I don't mean that you have to be married. I don't, I don't actually give care about any of that, but it is, it is, it is one of the holiest (laughs) gifts that we've been given by the universe. It is. And it's so funny to me because people on, on social media vacillate somewhere between calling us horse who uh, like I've seen things like uh, that, you know, Oh, uh, the moms for Liberty moms just have sex with everybody. And then I, and then uh, the other side of it is that they'll say like, Oh, we, you know, I, I, I'm going to go buy a bunch of vibrators and bring them to the moms for Liberty uh, meetings because you know, they, they, that's what they need. They need to get laid or they need to have an orgasm. And I, and I continue to say like, people know how people become moms. Right. But you know, one of the, you know, I, I, I don't want to be talking about sex with children, but I certainly am a sexual being, you know, and I was, um, I was watching one of the, one trans activists talking about how they had had the, the um, male to female genital, genital surgery where they, they invert the penis for anyone watching and you don't know, and they create like a cavity and, and it's basically like an open wound that you have to continue to dilate to keep open. And this trans activist was saying like, oh, men um, men don't know what they're like. Men would love my my vagina more than uh, you know a woman's vagina. And I just thought to myself, this is definitely a man who has never experienced a woman's vagina to be able to make that you know to that claim, right? I mean, well, you're you're making a joke here, but I have read about a lot of um, people who have had those surgeries, and they'll say, "I have never had sex," right. And I don't, um, I don't know. Isn't part of the Hippocratic oath to do no harm? Correct. And I, 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 I don't, I don't understand how. If I had to get, you know, go to a couple meetings before. I had a vasectomy at 40, by the way, not even at 20. Right. But if, if I, and I've known women who wanted to get hysterectomy, they never wanted children. They said, not hysterectomies, they want to get their tubes tied in their, in their 20s. They knew they never wanted children. The doctors wouldn't do it. Right. I don't know if that's still true, but it was true 30 years ago. I would and, imagine you'd have to go through quite a bit of counseling in order to have a doctor that would be willing to do it. But if you're 13, apparently, go for it. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I I am not a violent person at all, but if somehow somebody talked me into mutilating my genitals and then I later found out what an orgasm was, 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 I would want to kill somebody. That's, that is, and the thing is you only get one life. This isn't like you get to mess up. And I mean, there are certain things you can, you can come back from. I can, I can drop a computer and break it. And, oh, I carried a computer. I carried, uh, uh, I carried some leftovers in my backpack with a computer 
about a month and a half ago, and the leftovers destroyed my chicken teriyaki, destroyed my computer. Yeah, well, get a new computer, but I can get a new computer. You can't get yeah. a new set of genitals. Uh-uh, it's can. done. This is your life. You get one. So the, the problem with gender ideology to me, because people will always say like, well, it's, what about parental rights? I thought you believe in parental rights. You know, and I believe that parents have the fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their children, their education, their medical care, their morality, their religion. This is not a right the government gives you, it's not a right that they can take away easily. Right. And, and nor should it be. This is a fundamental right that you have as a parent. Um, but this idea that you, ha- you don't have the right to abuse your child. And so when we try and, and parents also deserve accurate information when they're making choices for their children, when they're making decisions. And that's been my big issue with the gender ideology stuff and gender affirming care in general is that parents haven't been told the truth. They've been lied to by doctors, by medical associations. They've been told that, you know, do you want a, a dead daughter or a live son? Um, and then they, um, it, it, the, just and the fact the puberty blockers that they've been lied to about the puberty blockers and say that they're reversible and there's in inner stage two for boys which is between the ages of nine and eleven if they're if they're given puberty blockers Lupron right if they're given puberty blockers there's no, there's evidence that they never are able to have an orgasm in their lives so if you put your child on puberty blockers at nine ten eleven years old your son there's evidence that shows that they'll never have an orgasm. Even if you stop the puberty blockers at some point, that's wild. The idea that a nine-year-old could be making that decision to never have that intimate experience with another human being is just wild and it's sick. And yet, you know, you've got the, Amer- the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, pushing this stuff and it's just crazy. So I agree. Response. I agree with your horror and I'm wondering if there's a question. No, there was no question. It was just my horror in stating the fact that, you know, I want parents to have accurate information, basically. I want them to have the truth, right, when, when they're making these decisions. They deserve the truth. I agree with that. I don't, I don't, I think even if they have accurate information and they attempt to go forward with um, harming a child that way, I don't, I, 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 I think that um, that I would consider that abuse. I agree with you. I just happen to think that the majority of parents aren't being given the truth and that if they were given the truth, they would be making different decisions. I think you'd still have a, a certain amount of ideologues who are buying into this for a number of different reasons, which we probably don't have time to get into right now. You know, own, their own things they've gone through in their lives, right? I see, we see that quite a bit with some of these moms. But just in general, I think that I, I choose to believe that the majority of parents really love their kids and want their children to have a happy life. And if they knew how damaging this was long term for the children, that they would make different decisions. <clears throat> so Lier thinks that um, that uh, the only thing that's going to stop this is actually the lawsuits from the right. transitioners. She's um, right. Chloe Cole and and um, Prisha Mosley. I just met her at, a, at an event. I, I think I think uh, your girlfriend's right. So I don't understand. I, 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 we can talk about it, but I don't really understand. I, I am fully aware that there are mass insanities that have taken over societies. I mean, look at Nazi Germany. You know, it was pretty nuts. And we can probably list French Reign of Terror for crying out loud. You know, there's there, there are lots of insanities that have taken over, but this 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 level. I don't really understand. I don't understand how this has become a hill that the left is going to die on. And I don't understand how it's taken over the left, even though, you know, like I said, old school lefty, and I understand queer theory. And and one of the things, it's a very small group, but I don't understand, and nobody cares about the group anyway, but I don't understand how it's taken over Earth First. Earth First is really funny because... It was formed about Earth first. One one point, the Earth is first. The physical reality of the Earth is first. And for a couple decades now, I've, I've pretty much called Earth first queer theory first. It's completely colonized it. And I don't understand how radical environmentalists have taken up a position of the body isn't primary. I, and I don't understand how adults 
I understand how somebody who's 16 can say this because, you know, we were all teenagers once. And I remember when I was uh, 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 at one point, when I was a very young driver, I thought that if you believe honestly enough, if you truly believe that you won't run out of gas, you won't. And what cured that was was running out of gas. <laughs> and um, anyway, so, I mean, we believe we can all come up with with strange things we believed as when we were but younger. But the things that you're talking about are so directly antithetical to themselves. You know, the idea of, you know, earth and nature and then to deny the reality of sex, right? I don't even say yes. biological it's just the reality of sex. They have two things that are so antithetical to each other, and yet these people are going to hold these beliefs as as in the same. I mean, it just it just blows my mind. And I don't understand how doctors can use the phrase "assigned male at birth." It's like okay, that's like saying "assigned human at birth." No, you were recognized as male. You were. You're not assigned. It's this is this this is the classic postmodernism thing. There is no reality, only the assignation, only the assignment. Not assignation is the wrong word. Um, the but it, it still makes no sense to me that are you assigned? Is this is this you know they do open heart surgery? Do they do do um, were you assigned a heart at birth? Um, was was this organ over here assigned lung at birth? It's just it's I don't. The level, you know, I started to say about the level of woman hating and the level of nature hating and the level of body hating is just stunning to me through all of this. And I don't understand how it's taken over the left. I don't understand how it's taken over society. We can talk about the billionaires, you know, we can talk about that, but that only goes so far. Well, there's a lot of money. I mean, I think that, you know, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of money to be had in this area. And when you look at Planned Parenthood and abortions and abortions going down and them not making as much money, they pivoted to something else. And this is something that they've been pushing. And um, I think it's just destabilizing in general. I think that's why they introduce, you know, a lot of this to the children. They want to destabilize the child. It's, it's, it, and this kind of brings me to my next point, which was um, Black Lives Matter. So Black Lives Matter and their original tenets, and then I think they took it off their website, but one of the things that they called for was the destruction of the nuclear family. And just this idea of destruction in general. But now we're seeing um, a lot of Black Lives Matter kind of morphing into other areas, right? It, a lot of these activists morphing into other areas. And one of the things I've heard you say before is, and I, and I wrote it down, if you have a social impulse that oftentimes of one, one way of that impulse being manifested, it moves to another one. So that like things, ch that things kind of evolve and change. And so, you know, you're, you look at earth first and now they're moving into queer theory. How does that happen? How does that energy get transferred into something else? And, and, you know, it, is it, is it political? Is there, is there, is there, is it as simple as a political aspect in the United States? And, um, things start to become, they, things start to divide people one way or another. And then it, you get it kind of, it, you're in the bucket of earth first. So now all of a sudden you have to be in the bucket of every other, you know, idea that, you know, this political party or, uh, or uh, do you know what I'm saying? Like, because I think if you asked in general about earth first, if you said to earth first, what political ideology do most of you as, uh, ascribe to or, or a party are you a part of? I think the majority would probably say Democrat. Am I wrong? Earth First originally, uh, their sort of unofficial name was Rednecks for Wilderness. Oh, um, um, I love them now. So, <laughs> so they were they were um, across the spectrum, and they okay. didn't they didn't care. What they cared about was was wild nature, and you could be some of them were far lefty, some of them were pretty hardcore right, and that was back when you could actually talk to people you disagreed with, and it's oh, strange. It strange thing and you agree with one issue you know it's like you and i probably disagree on any number of things but i don't care i mean it's, it's, we we agree on some things let's talk about those and we can talk about things we disagree with too i don't care um it doesn't make you a nazi um anyway the 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 the, the point i was making when i when i said that that the thing you quoted was i was talking about pre-american civil war there was chattel slavery and then they eliminated chattel slavery in the United States, but there was still the underlying bigotry that had manifested through that. And so that's how Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws evolved. And so if you sort of get rid of a problem, say legislatively or some, something, then 
there will be a way for it to creep back. And a great example of that having to do with the, the whole gender identity issue is that woman haters, we'll just put, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and label them just like they label us. So woman haters back in the, back in the 60s and 70s were very upset that there were things like women's sports and they didn't like it. They didn't like this, this stuff. And they couldn't get rid of women's sports that way. And so, but the underlying impulse to destroy women's sports, it only took 20, 30 years for it to manifest in a different way. Let's just have men and women's sports. That'll get rid of them. Right. And it's not that simple, but um, there's the underlying, you know, it's it's so extraordinary that it was only... I mean, the same thing we can talk about the, the you know, homosexual was getting castrated back in the old days and that stopped for a while and then and it's, back. it's back again because the underlying, underlying issues haven't been dealt with. And we, you know, there was, there was this, this time in the seventies where, and again, the seventies weren't ideal, but there was the, um, I always get it backwards, free to be you and me, free to be me and you, whichever it is. Where, um, you know, little, like I bought a used car when I was like 21 and the person I asked to help me was, she would call herself this, this is not an insult. She was a bull dyke. She was, she's big. She probably could have kicked my ass if she wanted to, um, kick my butt. Sorry. Um, she, she, and she wore coveralls, you know, she was just every stereotype there was. And she knew cars better than I did. You know, I didn't know cars at all, really. But anyway, she's the one I took to, to, to when, I, when I bought a used car because she knows cars. And that's okay. She was perfectly happy lesbian. And she, she and her girlfriend actually came with me to get the car. And, um, and, and now- today she would have been told she would have been told that she was born in the wrong body and they yep. would have tried to cut off her breasts and yeah, feed her drugs and shorten her life expectancy and yep. her bone density and all the things. So that's why I say, you know, I'm not saying it's a golden era, but that's why I'm saying there was a time when it was perfectly accepted. No big deal. You know, when, when I drove up to the guy's house to buy the pickup, for God's sake, I go up to buy a pickup from this guy, bringing a bull dyke and her girlfriend with me. And he didn't buy, he didn't bat an eye. It's 1981 or 1982. Like, yeah. And and now, like you said, that be, that's because there's this underlying, you know, the word phobia is used way too much, but I'm going to use it just for shorthand. There's an underlying lesbophobia that's, that's there, that's pushing this now, that wasn't dealt with. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? No, no, that- I 100% understand what you're saying. Absolutely. And I think I'm, I, I, I did doctor, I've been on Dr. Phil twice in the past three years. Imagine that's great. That. Oh yeah, it's it's fascinating. Dr. Phil is like one of the few people who's actually having conversations and bringing people together who may not agree. But Candace Jackson, do you know Candace? Have you ever heard of her before? She does a lot of. She's a lawyer. Um, she worked uh, in uh, the Office of Civil Rights under uh, President Trump. Um, she's done a podcast with me. Um, she um, is a lesbian. She was talking about gay marriage. Who she came on with me when I went on Dr. Phil, and she was saying, you know that. That, that what gays and lesbians wanted was tolerance and respect, but not for celebration. Um, and that, you know, because now in the schools, we have this idea of this for celebration, there's no room for pluralism because there's no room for tolerance. And, and I think society in general, we've gotten to that. So one of the things when I was thinking about this interview that I wanted to find an excuse to say, and now's my time to, 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 to do it, having to do with the sort of force stuff is that, I think we could, we, one can make an argument for United States and state flags in a classroom, or one can make an argument against them. I actually don't care, but I don't think there is any other flag that belongs in a classroom, um, mm-hmm. unless it's a math classroom, and then you can have like the the math flag if there is such a thing. Um, you know, or if you, you're talking about a country, because you know someone's someone moved from another country and they want to share about their beautiful country and their culture. And then maybe they would say, this is the flag of my country. And then you would maybe talk about that. But I mean, in the space of that, I agree with you. The idea that you've got, I mean, if there's one thing good that came out of COVID, for heaven's sake, look at the, well, look what was exposed. You know, teachers with giant pride flags, and trans flags and the trans, you know, one of the things that was so interesting to me that you mentioned on the podcast 
podcast with Harvey Milk. And the fact that Harvey Milk is, is taught to our children and celebrated it uh, in uh, LGBTQ History Month now or whatever it is we have. But, I mean, Harvey Milk was uh, a predator. They don't mention that. They don't mention that part. Yeah, which is horrifying. And I didn't even know that until like 10 years ago. It's, I mean, that, that took me a long, I mean, I was, before then I was like, yeah, Harvey Milk, Harvey Milk, Harvey, and it's like, huh. Um, and another thing I want to mention having to do with all this is that when I first taught at a university, and I was just an adjunct, um, my supervisor, he, he did a, a program for all of us before we were allowed to teach. And one of the things he said, this is 1989, one of the things he said is you absolutely need to keep your politics out of the classroom. Your job is to teach writing and thinking. And he said, if a student writes something that you find offensive, your job is to help them write it better. And he would be fired for that now. But I fully believe that, that um, my job, and I do teach writing, is, is to help people. I don't have to agree with them. And if I disagree with them, then my job is, is to, I love this line. I made this up. The job of, the task of an editor for a writer, the task of an editor is to help the writer say what the writer wants to say in the way the writer wants to say it only better. And the task of a teacher, well, it depends. If you're teaching math, your job's to teach math. Right. But in terms of, oh, I love this. So especially being associated with, with schools, I think this is a good thing for you to know, unless you already do, that the root of the word education comes from educra. And it means to lead forth or draw out. And so one of the things that you're supposed to do as a teacher is to lead, to draw the students out. And you don't do that by, uh, I contrast that following Joseph Campbell with the root inculcation, which is inculcare, which means to stamp in with the heel. And I have heard about students getting bad grades. I've known people who've had kids who've gotten bad grades because they write something objecting to gender ideology. And that's not, even if it's brought up, in, in, if some student writes a paper on gender ideology, even if they're pro-gender ideology, as a teacher, my job would be to help them to write it better. My sure. job is not to, and I say this as something I, as something I disagree with, Sure. Um, the job of teachers is not to propagandize, no matter what we're talking about. So I don't think there should be BLM flags. I don't think there should be Exxon Mobil flags. I don't think there should be UN flags. And like I said, we can make the argument against the U.S. and, and state flags. I don't actually care. But I do care about, there shouldn't be a Mormon flag. I don't know if the Mormons have a flag. But if the Mormons have a flag, it shouldn't be in the classroom. Um, and I sh there shouldn't be an eco ecology flag either. You know, we can make the argument maybe in a biology class, but probably not. So the last thing I have, one more question for you before okay, we great. I'm very curious about this. Um, I think one of the spaces where uh, people on the right really lose the younger generation is when we talk about the environment. And I don't think that we talk enough about the, uh, about, I mean, when I, I, I'm, I was born in 1979, I'm 44, cycling was really big when I was right? We were cycling clubs and recycle. We don't have to talk about recycling in general, but the environment. I think young people are concerned. I think it's part of being younger and looking forward, you know, to your future. And, and I don't think that Republicans are very good at really um, having a conversation and listening to Gen Z or younger about some of those concerns. Um, just some thoughts for you on how we can engage more people in conversation about the realities of the environment um, without some of the authoritarianism that I think we're seeing around climate change and some of the decisions that are being made. And you and I will probably have disagreements about some of it, but maybe not um, about some of the things that, I mean, I think that there are some things that are being proposed that are going to kill a lot of people. Um, and, and that's very concerning. And so just some questions about balance as we, Age younger people in, you know, I don't, I don't want to lose them because we're not willing to engage on an issue that they care about. Well, a couple of things. Um, yes. One of them is that uh, 
I wrote a book called Bright Green Lies about how uh, wind and solar aren't going to save the planet and how it's actually been a very destructive to the environmental movement to take that on the way they have because you have this huge social movement that has become essentially, or a huge ecological movement that has essentially become a lobbying arm for a sector of industrial capitalism. And that's, I mean, the, the anti-war movement during Vietnam did not become, like if you ask, if there's people marching down the street of Washington, D.C., you ask them, why are you marching? They say, to save the earth. They say, what do you want? We want subsidies for the wind and solar industry. Like, you just became a lobbyist for that industry. That's, that's horrible. And it's not going to help the planet. Birds don't want them. Bats don't want them. So we might actually end up agreeing on some of that. Certainly don't. The whales certainly don't want them. Oh, I completely agree with you. In fact, we're just starting a campaign out here to fight uh, wind energy going off of one county south of here. Um, yeah, it's horrible. Horrible. Anyway, the other thing is – so some lefties, some, some of the new lefties are going to hate me even more for saying this, but I've said it a bazillion times – that I became an environmentalist because I am fundamentally conservative, by which I don't mean socially conservative or any of the other stuff that comes with it necessarily. But I just think it's a really stupid idea to destroy, to wipe out runs of salmon that you might need to eat tomorrow. I think it's a terrible idea. And, and I'm not by saying that, I'm not saying that salmon shouldn't exist for their own sake and they don't, shouldn't exist for the forest's sake. I just think it's really stupid to do open air experiments, like to dump endocrine disruptors all over the planet. I just think open air experiments are remarkably ridiculous. And I think that if you, I love the line by David Ehrenfeld about how, because we can commit minor miracles like open heart surgery or MRI machines, we think that means we can commit major miracles like managing a forest or managing the oceans. And that is incredibly arrogant. And, and I or think- changing rem- the sex Or changing the bi- your, bi- your sex. Exactly. Exactly. It's the same deal. And yeah. so my analysis attempts to be reality-based. And so I try to start with- Let's look at how is environmentally, how is this species doing? And if they're not doing well, what's the trend and what are we going to do about it? And um, it's the same with everything else that I start with reality that. It makes a lot of sense now. It makes a lot of sense to me now why clear theory has been so disturbing to you. It's just kind of a full circle moment because if you, there's a tribe in Africa, I think it's the Maasai tribe and the way they greet each other is they say, how are the children? And what they want to hear back is the children are well. But if I, if you asked me, how are the children in America right now? I would have to tell you they're not well. The kids are not okay. And so the idea that you would ask, is this, how is a species doing? And that the answer would be, well, the human species is not doing well right now. And that leads you to have to question, why is that? And how can you fix it? So it's a, it's a good full circle moment, Derek Jensen. And I think it's, even if we disagree on issues, I just, here's the thing, is you get to have your own opinions. Isn't that nice of me to grant you the ability to have your own opinions? Um, you get to have your own opinions. I get to have my own opinions, but you don't get your own facts. Mm-hmm. And I don't get my own facts. And this is this is why I started with postmodernism or was early on about postmodernism is because so like I think we would agree back to the gender ideology we would agree it's like a, a point where you know usually conversation I found that that it takes people a long time to change their mind if somebody's arguing with you a lot of times if you say something they don't agree with you right away but there was one time I was having a conversation with somebody and she said well, I don't really understand your position on the gender ideology thing. What about a little boy who likes to dance like a girl and sing like a girl? And, and what, about, what about him? And I said, the problem is the phrase sings like a girl. That's right. That's the problem. The problem is not the little boy. A little boy who loves to sing and who loves to dance and who loves to 
play with dolls should be loved as a little boy who loves to sing and dance and play with dolls. And a little girl who loves to work on cars and play football should be loved for being a little girl who loves to work on cars and play with football. And I don't understand. I honestly don't understand how we get called bigots for having that perspective. I don't know the answer to that, but um, I'm not going to stop saying it. And I hope you don't stop saying it either. I won't. Um, I, don't, I believe that you won't. Because um, my, uh, my mom yeah. raised me right. That's right. There you go. Good, good way to go, mom. Um, so Derek, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated uh, this conversation and learning more from you about queer theory and um, postmodernism and just talking about kind of the state of America and exploring different ideas. I hope this conversation is helpful to the people that listen. If people want to follow you, Derek, or learn more about you or any of the books that you've written, where should they go? Um, I got a website, DerekJensen.org, D-E-R-R-I-C-K-J-E-N-S-E-N.org. And that's a pretty good introduction. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I very much appreciate you joining me. Oh, it was fun. You, you had great questions. It was fun talking with you. <laughs>